Hello and a warm welcome to another of uh, the Ruda Talks Change chats on the Change Exchange, which always makes me fluff. Um, we talk about we talk about change here. We talk about life paths and how there are choices sometimes, decisions sometimes, and at other times life itself just throws you a curveball and you have to go in a different direction. And uh, today my guest is Skalk with Side Note, comedian, serious actor, very busy on stage and screen, even the very small screen these days. Hmm? Um, Skalk, you're so welcome. Hello, Rida. You, you are going to see a, a big change in me now, because firstly, I don't have a, I had to shave my snore for a role, and also <laughs> I have to speak uh, English now for 40 minutes, then I do tend to change a little bit. You'll see a frown. Yeah, it's just, that's just me concentrating. <laughs> I know. I've just, uh, I just said to Skulk, you know, I grew up in the Northern Cape where even black people only speak Afrikaans. So wow. I had to, I acquired this accent with, with great moeite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, yeah, it's also about... we, in Kenton Park, we only spoke English in self-defense, you yeah, know. Yeah, absolutely. So... So no. talking about that, the first big change in your life was Kenton Park, and then you went to UCT. Yeah. Evans, why? There are acting schools in, in Africa, at Afrikaans universities. Why did you choose a the Cape, a Cape Town option? Well, I, I had very limited, I would call it like contacts in the industry, but I was at a little drama school, you know, that was run by an actress, and, you know, I just, in, anyone I could ask that had some sort of connection to the industry, mm. I asked all of them, where would you say is the best drama department in the country? Because that's where I want to go. If they told me it was Porch, I would have gone to Porch. Yeah. Um, but spoiler alert, it wasn't Porch. Um, most people, if not all of them, actually, I think said, listen, you can't go wrong with UCT because UCT, as a specialized course, they've got BI drama, which, which, you know, is the theory and everything. And then within that, they've got theater and performance, which only takes 30 students a year. Of that 30, obviously, uh, you know, uh, it's very diverse. So there's, uh, um, it gets divided also between races and cultures and men and women. So as, let's say Afrikaans white male, there's two spots, three spots, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't get in the first time I auditioned. And um, I mean, I also can't really blame them. I didn't have guidance, you know, in my, in my audition. Um, and cause I just took two monologues of the internet. I think it was literally monologue.com. And I just didn't, <laughs> I just didn't have anyone to tell me so, okay, you have to take monologues out of a play. Like it has to be a proper written thing, not monologue.com. So shame. I got there with my monologue.com monologues. Um, so I can't really blame them that, that they didn't let me in. But um, I still went to UCT and did a general BA in that first year and re-auditioned at the end of that. By that stage, I'd met a third year student that kind of took me under his wing and said, come, let me, let me coach you a bit and help you choose your monologues and so on. Uh, but hey, I do believe strongly that everything happens for a reason because that first year that I was just doing a general BA that I didn't get in was the year that I started stand-up comedy and I wouldn't have started it otherwise. Why? How did that happen? Well, because theatre, uh, uh, um, I mean, BA drama, it's mostly theoretical. You kind of kind of have one practical class uh, a week in that practical class. It's also not really fulfilling stuff that you're doing. It's, it's kind of the base work. Um, I remember it so well. Be, you had to be one of the elements. Fire, earth, water, wind. And I got wind. And then I had to blow around the room like a plastic packet. You had, they said, you're a packet. You're a plastic packet in the wind. Blow, blow. And then you had to you know, blow around there, be a plastic packet, you know, and I just got home a oh, while well, to the res and I was just like, oh my word, is this acting, being a plastic packet, is this making me a better actor? And I was just craving 
to be on stage, to be in front of an audience. And I was like, how can I, how can I do that? And then somehow I fell into comedy and, you know, it was just a wonderful way that I could perform, even though it's not acting and it's a different art form, I could still perform, I could be in front of people. And then also now and then you, you know, if you did really well, the guy who owned the bar or the club would give you a, a 500 mil beer, a draft and a burger, you know, which is huge to a student. Sometimes you get a hundred bucks and it would be amazing for a student, you know. <laughs> what, what was it like that, that first few times when you stood in front of an audience and you could feel, I know it doesn't always work, but um, yeah. when it works, how, tell me about that. I was saying to someone the other day, it is, it is really like, drugs like if you look at a drug addict the way they cannot eventually cope without it and you know obviously the you know drugs is a it's a almost like a negative example but it's the best kind of thing that I can use you know and when you watch movies or documentaries about drug addicts that when you can see in their face when they take that hit that absolute euphoria that they go into you know that is stand-up comedy, I think for most comedians, that when, when, when you get a big laugh, you know, you just can stand there on stage and just bask yeah. in it. And also when you don't do it for a while, you, you, you get depressed, you miss it, you, you need it, you need it in your life, you know? Um, and that's, I guess, part of the reason why in the lockdown I was making all these videos on Instagram and Facebook because I needed to perform, you know? And I was like, I don't care if they aren't immediate laughs. If the laugh is in the form of someone commenting a crying laughing emoji in the comment section, at least I know that I'm performing mm -hmm. and somewhere on the other side of the phone, it's being received and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still performing in a way. Yeah. In 2013, uh, you won the Newcomer Award at the Comics Choice, and that yeah. got you onto the stage as, a, as an opening act for Trevor Noah. That must have been yeah. amazing. Yeah, I always tell people that, you know, like one of, the, one of the many reasons that I really respect Trevor is when I was opening for him, at the theater at Monte Cassino, it had just, he hadn't started the Daily Show yet, but it had already been announced that he was the new host. And you know, obviously the tickets sold like, like hot cakes and it was packed every night, sold out, sold out. Um, six nights a week in a 1,800 seat the theater. And I always tell people that the last person who needed an opening act to warm up the audience is Trevor Noah, because that's kind of the opening act's job is to, to get the audience a bit warmed up. And, you know, but by the time they walked into the theater, they were so excited to see Trevor, they were warm. He didn't need me, <laughs> you know, he, didn't, he really didn't need me or anyone else for that matter to go on and warm them up, you know, but he still chooses to have an opening act because he knows what a huge yes. what huge exposure it is and what a huge opportunity it is for someone who at that time is completely unknown i mean by the end of that month it was i worked it out one day i think 50 or 60 thousand people that saw me in the space of a month if i I, I mean, I would have had, I, I don't know, that, that would be years of club mm. gigs mm. for that amount of people to see you and now yeah. know who you are. Uh, and, you know, I managed to get that level of exposure in, in just a month. Even to this day, some people who come to my one-man show say to me, the first time I saw you was when you opened for Trevor Noah at the Teatro. Mm -hmm. So, no, that was incredible. It was a gift. You know? and I mean, it was, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the TV work, you, you presented the click in a hotel or Kijknet and so on. Yeah. Uh, do you enjoy TV work? How is it different? Well, stand-up comedy is something separate. But yes. working with a camera is also 
completely different from, from that spontaneous interaction. How did you experience it? Well, acting, like growing up, acting was and will always be my first love. You know, I wanted to, to be an actor before I even knew what stand-up comedy was. I think my first exposure to stand-up comedy was probably in high school when people started sending around clips of Trevor Noah on their phone and clips of other stand-up comedians. But, you know, the, the closest I saw to stand-up comedy was when I, you know, when I was young, my mom would take me to go watch Casper de Vries, his shows, you know, or Nathaniel. And even that, it's not straight stand-up comedy. It's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's character work and it's singing and it's almost like bordering on cabaret, especially Nathaniel. Um, Casper does has a lot of like multimedia and he does a lot of characters and so on. So before I even like thought of stand-up comedy, you know, I loved acting and I wanted to act and work on TV and so on. And I love having a balance of the two. You know, I never want to do one or the other. I never want to just act. I never want to just do stand-up comedy because I always miss the one when I'm not doing it. So, you know, you do an acting project and it's a month and anything you do full time, you get a bit hot for eventually. You know, eventually like after acting project, you're like, okay, thank you. I've, I've acted now enough. I want to go back to stand-up comedy and I want to do that now. But then after a month of shows, you also get a bit tired and then you want to act again. And so, so I'm constantly craving, you know, one or the mm, other. Both. So um, mm. if I can, my ideal career is if I can for six months of the year uh, act and for six months of the year, uh, do stand up because every time you go back to the one that you were missing, you you also just like appreciate it all over again. Yeah. And you probably uh, there's something fresh. Um, you you kind of more awake uh, rather than having done it now for the past six months. And the other thing I think uh, for an entertainer. Uh, just on a practical level, I, I know that Dion Opperman, who started after, used to say to his students, you need five strings to your bow. You can never just do one thing. Um, yeah. If you want to do, if you want to be a commercial, a commercially viable entertainment person, you need to do everything. And there's, there's also that. Hmm? Yeah, and I, I, I do, exactly, and I don't, I don't ever want to be one dimensional as like the funny guy and so on, you know, in interviews, people always say I come across very serious, I'm trying to work on that, but um, it's not that I'm serious, it's just that I'm so passionate about comedy and acting, so when I talk about it, I tend to get like very serious, you know, because for me, it's not it's not a joke, you know, it's, it's, this is what I do. It's my career. I'm very serious about what I do. Um, <laughs> but, um, you're very serious about comedy. Yes. I'm very serious. Yeah. Comedy is no joke. You know, yeah. I always say yeah. so. Um, Scott, but talking about that, um, brings us to Canari, ne? which is one of the major things that you've done in your life. And it is so the opposite of comedy. Um, how did you, you experienced that. You've said that uh, the the director Christian Ulrich that he he really pushed you into doing things that uh, did, may not have come naturally. Hmm? Yeah, just uh, Christian is a brilliant. I think because when Christian was a student, he was an actor himself. Um, so he just really knows how to direct performance. Of course, he can also direct the technical aspects but he really knows how to work with mm. actors and he gets to know you personally because the way he would direct me would not be the same as he directs Anamart van der Merwe because he knows me and he knows Anamart and he's got a different relationship with each of us and the way he speaks to me is maybe more like a, a older brother younger brother kind of relationship the way he speaks to Anamart you know, he approaches the whole thing differently, which was for me so incredible to see. So he gets to know the, the person um, behind the actor and then he knows how to get the best performance out of you, you know? Like, um, I think when I watched Canary, I was like, I didn't know I could do that. 
Um, so what did, yeah, what did and, you, how did you get into it? Did he approach you or were there auditions? So ironically, all of the acting roles and serious acting roles that I've gotten in my life, I kind of got because of stand-up. Um, Christian saw me do stand-up comedy at the Car Con Car one year. And in that show, I had a joke about how I sang in the choir in school. And Kanari obviously is about this young man in the choir in the army in the 80s. And I think that's, well, he says that that sparked the idea when I spoke about me being in the choir that like, hmm, maybe I should let this guy audition, you know? And I, that's why I think uh, Christian's vision comes in because I think a lot of people would have just gone, he's a comedian. He's not, yeah. he can't play, he's not gonna play the lead actor in my very serious movie, um, you know? But Christian was like, I think I had that bit of vision to be like, Comedians can be great dramatic actors. Like, mm. I think Jim Carrey, mm. if you've watched some of his more serious work, he's a brilliant dramatic actor. And mm. the same with, um, like, a lot of the, the big com comedy stars, you know. You've said that uh, to make people laugh, you have to know what makes them cry. What do you yeah. mean? I... Well, it's all about like human emotion, you know? Um, so if you can, if you can make, if you understand how to make someone laugh, then you do understand how to make them cry. Because if you can understand what makes someone happy, you can also understand what makes them sad. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And I think because comedians also like, uh, you know, when, when we are at home or in our private lives, we also obviously have a deeper side. And it is awesome to sometimes get a role where you can give like a bit of an outlet to that side of you, you know. But I mean, comedy is also evolving. Like it's getting to a point where comedians are really talking about very, very serious matters uh, on stage and not always necessarily in a funny way. You know, there's these days comedy specials, brilliant comedy specials you watch on on Netflix where the comedian is speaking for 10 minutes and you don't laugh once, but you are still like mm. glued to the screen because, but that is a choice they make to say, I'm not gonna give you the relief of a punchline now because I need to say this thing and it's serious, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, talk to me about the Vara right? and uh, working with, uh, because it's, it's not what you've been talking about now, but there is something similar that you're addressing serious issues. Well, I think yeah. comedy always does. The best comedy always does. But uh, in that, uh, you did what? Four seasons? Three, um, yeah. We've done three seasons. We've done three of them. And well, it's for me wonderful to work just firstly, like to work in Afrikaans, like when you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The click and tell you know the first five years of my career was all in English because there wasn't a club scene for Afrikaans comedy. So if you are an Afrikaans person, the same goes for Kosa Zulu, whatever. The the scene or the club scene was mostly English. So you know I think most comedians on the lineup at every club every club gig that you that you go to is, was speaking in their second language or third or fourth. You know, so, um, and then when I graduated, you know, I got the opportunity to do the click. And then that was my first time on Afrikaans TV. And then Hotel, and then Canari, and um, then Divara Norait, you know. And um, I love working in Afrikaans because, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, I love Afrikaans. I love Afrikaans culture. I love being Afrikaans. Um, and, you know, the Afrikaans entertainment industry is amazing. And also, you know, like uh, I wanted to, with, with the Vara Narayt, I wanted to kind of challenge that whole status quo of like Afrikaans people being so conservative and Afrikaans mm. TV being conservative, you know, and you can't say this and you can't talk about that. And I wanted to challenge those things and, you know, and just kind mm. of speak out about things that happen in the news saying this is wrong, you know, mm. whether it's white people, black people, whatever, you know, if it's wrong, it's wrong. And if it's right, it's right. 
you know. And, and they're, uh, they're, it also struck me, you seem to be in a very close working relationship with uh, Bibi Slippers and um, Adam Schrindler. Yeah. And well, in my own life, I absolutely love being part of a team when it really works well. Yeah. Did, yeah. Uh, and you were writing and producing the three of you together. Hmm? Yeah, I met Bibi. Uh, she, she, you know, both of them have a background in journalism and Bibi interviewed me for an article once and then that was just before we were shooting with Tal and she stayed in London at the time. So she said, look, I've got a spare room if you need a place to stay. I was living in Cape Town at the time. Um, you know, come stay there. And then, you know, we became really good friends. And me and Adams, I met him when he booked me for his French bachelor's party to do stand up at his friend's bachelor's party. And at that stage, I was doing all my shows myself from filling in the forms to getting the shows on sale and it was so much work and I really needed a partner in crime or basically a manager and um, I approached Adams after mm -hmm. that and I said would you be interested in doing something like that and then we started working together and it was a no-brainer for me when Karen Mayrung the head of CakeNet said you know um, we want to give you the show and it's going to be new satire and everything and I said the first thing I said was my team needs to be BB and Adams. They both know the news. They're always clued up on what's happening. They've got journalism backgrounds. They can write. They are both hilarious. And um, yeah, we make a good team. Mm -hmm. And um, now you're in Bidderlanders, which is a completely different setting. And uh, does Bidderlanders, forgive me for not knowing, is it a daily or is it once a week? Uh, Bindelanders is daily because it it, it, it it started as a once a week drama series. Bindelanders has gone through a lot of um, phases. You know, it was like a drama series once a week mm. and then it was an hour long show every day. And then suddenly it became Bindelanders at Judica. Then there were lawyers involved and no one knew what was going on. Then it was they scrapped the lawyers and went back to just Bindelanders. <laughs> But anyway, it's a soap. It's, it's eventually evolved to a soapy. And uh, I did it for a month last year. It was a short story arc. And, you know, I also always just want to do everything. You know, I want to, mm. like, like it's that th coming back to that thing that you said about you like having five bows, you know, I want to act. And within acting, I want to act in comedy. I want to act in thrillers. I want to act in dramas. And I want to do stand-up and sometimes I want to host a show, um, sometimes a funny show, sometimes a more serious show, you know. Um, Derek Watts doesn't know it, but I'm going to take God Blanche over one day. Um, I want to have the host Butchika Fro, and, you know, on that list is also a soapy. I've always wanted to do a soapy because I just like, I would love to just feel what it feels like to be in a soapy for a month, you know. And for, what was it like? It was, it was a challenge at first because they shoot with multiple cameras, you know, and it's way more technical. And it's like, you have to walk on this line. You have to stop on this line. Um, you have to look there on this word. Um, but it was awesome. And Benalanish is such a nice work environment, you know. Um, for the first time in my life, I had a dressing room. You know, I don't think people understand actually how um, unluxurious acting is in South Africa or the entertainment industry, your backstage area at a show is normally like the broom yeah. closet that they put a bucket of beers in there for you. Um, it's very unglamorous. <laughs> and shooting like movies or series, you know, we don't have trailers. We don't have like uh, the American, mm. like those big trailers with couches and Wi-Fi. It's normally a gazebo with three plastic chairs underneath and they say, okay, that's where the actors can sit. And you sit there baking in the sun. No, it's not glamorous at all. So when I got to Vanillander for the first time in my life, I'm like, wow, I have a dressing room. You know, I actually have somewhere with a bed in it. Um, where I can chill. They actually gave me Hans Strydom, you know, plays at Koster, you know, the big, um, and Hans Strydom's an absolute legend, but he wasn't shooting the, the time I was shooting, so they gave me his dressing room. And uh, one day, oh. it was so hot in October, and I was lying there just in my underwear um, in Hans Strydom's dressing room, because it was my dressing room. Then Hans Strydom walked in uh, to come get collect some scripts, and I just... 
jumped up. I'm in my underwear and I didn't know what to do. Do I quickly put on my pants? Do I quickly, do I hide myself behind the duvet? I was like, what did, you know, because if I quickly put on my pants, then maybe it looks like I was busy with something dodgy. So I just got up and I just said, <laughs> hello, Hans. And I just stood there in my underwear as he walked past and grabbed his scripts and we started having to have this whole conversation and I'm just standing there in my underwear. But I mean, it was, it was actually wonderful. I'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah. After Faf de Klerk, underwear is, um, you know, no. the new black. Um, no. <laughs> um, uh, tell me something. Uh, working in, in such a... Um, well, work comes and goes, it's gigs and it's uh, contracts end, etc. Et what have you learned about managing time and money? Uh, I don't know where I got this saving thing from. I don't know if my parents taught me or if it's just in me, but I saved, saved, saved when I was in school already, like every bit of pocket money of course now and then i would treat myself and go buy myself a like a cd of a band that i liked or a t-shirt or something but i would all since school i saved saved my money and um, especially when i started making money from stand-up comedy i was still a student at the time i was very lucky that i was getting like a salary uh, well not a salary uh, pocket money from my parents you know now and then um, so like the money that I saved from stand up, I would put away, put away. And um, I kind of still every day save as if tomorrow I'm suddenly not going to be relevant anymore mm. or there's going to be a new Afrikaans comedian with a curly afro that's going to be funnier. Um, you know, it's like a very pessimistic way to, to look at it. But, you know... Um, it's, it's, it's also just, you can, I feel like if you have that safety net, then you, you can actually enjoy life more than, than you would if, if um, you buy yourself a freaking Ferrari or whatever. Like, for me, but just you live, knowing... But you live on the edge constantly, yeah. Mm. yeah just, and it gives just, you the freedom, of course, to sometimes say to yourself, okay, I'm going to spend a month developing a, a concept. Yes, um, exactly. A month in which I may not have an income. Uh, if you if you don't build that safety net, a bit of a mixed metaphor, but uh, yeah, you couldn't do that. Exactly, and then eventually you can also start being more picky with your projects. Sometimes mm. you're doing something mm. just for the money, and it's not creatively uh, fulfilling. It's not something that you're proud of afterwards. You know, it's yeah. actually, it's the worst feeling in the world when you finish a project and you and your first thought is like, oh my word, I hope as little as possible people see this because I'm actually embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid we've all been there. Um, <laughs> embarrassed, you know, whether it's so, an ad. Yeah. Yeah, so, about, um, so, 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 so just, and that is something, yeah, sorry, that is something one of my lecturers taught us when we were in university, her name is Sandra Temming. She always said, if you get a soapy, do it and save all that money, save all that money that you can get. And, uh, and then you can, after a few years, you end the soapy and then you've got all the savings and then you only do the projects that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's advice for every young person who goes into the entertainment industry. Huh? Um, yes. How did you uh, keep your nose above water through COVID, through the lockdown? Um, I was very lucky that I had uh, an online, um, well, a social media expert that I met before COVID, and she would help me now and then if I if I did like Afrikaans festivals or anything. She would help me to to do Facebook ads because I would make my own Facebook ads and, you know, all the comments are just like, why am I seeing this guy? I hate him. And I said to her, Magrit, I think I'm doing it wrong because obviously I'm not targeting the right people because then after the show, people who do like me say, did you do a show in Oatswood and I didn't even know? 
So I said, to, I need help with my social media, not with the content, but with the back end of things, you know, creating the ads and targeting the right people so that the right people are coming to the shows or seeing it so that they can come to the shows. And as soon as lockdown happened, because she knows online stuff and she hosts, you know, these webinars, she's, she, she said to me, you have to do an online show. Come on, I will help you. I said to her, if you run it, and run all the technical stuff. I'm really not good with technology. I just want to do the show. I want to log on in front of the camera. I want to do the show and I want all the technical stuff to be taken care of. And she said, no problem. And if it wasn't for her, I don't think I would have done it because I wouldn't have been able mm. to figure it out myself. It's incre It is actually doing online shows was way more work and admin than doing a live show. Because a live show there's not that much that can really go wrong. I mean, you get to the theater, you do your sound check. Load shedding is the only thing that can go wrong in a live show. And I've even had that happen in a live show. And I've just shown a, 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 put a torch on myself and I projected. Luckily, I've got a theater background and it wasn't like a big theater. It was in George. 200 people. I did the whole show with no mic and I just spoke to the people. So, but in a, in a, in a, Online show, if the thing crashes or your internet does um, disconnects, then the whole thing is in its mood. So um, it was hard. It was it was hard to figure out. But um, <laughs> once again, like it was so awesome to sit there and see in the comment section how different families that were broken up from lockdown that were in maybe different places in the country or even in different parts of the world, how they were chatting and communicating and enjoying the show together, even though they were apart. For me, that was incredibly special that my show could bring people together in that way, you know, and that they could... Yeah. Could communicate in the comment section and say, oh my word, Ruda, that 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 person he describes there, that's you. You know, and then you're like, oh my word, yes, that is so me. You know, and those people are sitting in two different worlds <laughs> or two different houses, but <laughs> that hour they were together, you know, that was beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Skulk, on a, on a more that. personal note, um, talking about family, um, with uh, your, uh, um, uh, what did you call it, lockdown laughs, you involved your parents at times. You seem to be really close. And yeah. what, did, what did they teach you about relationships? There was that one clip where you said, you asked them, um, what's the most important thing? And your mum said, patience. And your father said, yes, patience and mercy <laughs> mercy <laughs> what, what did you take from them which you want to which you want to take into your relationship because i think your dad's right mercy is a big thing yeah oh you know like they just i mean those two things i think that sums it up you know like they just so patient with each other obviously there's times that I can see my dad is irritated with my mom or my mom is irritated with my dad. But, you know, they just kind of take a deep breath and, you know, carry on. And, and Mercy, you know, obviously like any relationship, there's ups and downs or in a marriage, you know, and they, at the end of the day, it's just about communicating and working it out and, um, I mean, with me also, you know, they've always just like been so supportive, even though they don't always like what I say on stage, you know, um, especially sometimes the swear words, you know, gets a bit much for them sometimes. But at the end of the day, it's just endless love and support, merciless <laughs> love and support. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, tell me about your own relationship, if I may ask. How did you meet Mika? And uh, do you, when did you know she was the right one? Uh, we met kind of at a party in Johannesburg and we just met, you know, and then just kind of saw each other around on the social scene in Johannesburg and we had some mutual friends. And then I came to Johannesburg for work and I was single at the time. And um, I said, you know, would you like to go have a drink? And I think definitely that 
I mean, it sounds very creepy to say that first night I knew, but the first night I knew at least that we were going to be together for a while. I knew it was going to be a long-term thing and it wasn't going to be like a kind of weekend romance or a kind of fling, you know, and I definitely knew that I wanted to pursue this in a serious way. And um, I think after about a year, I knew I wanted to, to marry her but then I also thought it was maybe a bit uh, desperate to ask someone to marry you so quickly and uh, then what? I waited another year uh, I don't know you know I just I didn't I didn't want to scare her off too quickly and you know um, after a year already be like let's get married you know and we're still young and um, so I waited another year and then after two years I thought okay after two years you know if you don't know then it's time to move on. You know, if, if, if you yeah. don't think you're going to marry the person after two years, I, this is my own made up timelines anyway. Um, then I think, you know, it's either let's go for it or let's go our separate ways, you know, but I knew, you know, this is it. And um, I also to marry me and she what said, you yes. Think, can, you, can you put it in words? What made you know that? What was it that, 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 made you say this is something I want to take seriously? Uh, we are very opposite and I think with my personality that works for me to not be with someone who's also kind of loud and out there and you know I think it helps to it helps me oh, balance you. out yes mm -hmm. and it also helps my partner who is Mika, um, you know, to kind of, because she's more shy and drawn back, you know, so I think we help each other. She calms me down and I help her, I guess, get out of it, climb out of a shell a little bit, you know, and I just think um, we complement, our personalities complement each other nicely because two big personalities, you know, in my experience end up, just mm -hmm. clashing um so i feel like if i've got a sort of energy that's a bit opposite to mine that that really mm -hmm. works i know they say opposites attract which i don't always think is the case but in my case you know that mm -hmm. works and i don't want to even though she is in my industry she works in our department which is mm -hmm. the behind the scenes but i don't want to i don't really want to date someone who's also a performer in front of the camera i you know, I have to deal with myself enough. I don't want to deal with another <laughs> performer in my life. <laughs> How do you, just in practical terms, you are both busy, you both work in the entertainment industry where the hours and the timelines are really unpredictable and uncontrollable often. How do you keep the connection? I know it's early days. I mean, I've been married more than 40 years, so... You know, it feels wow, as if God. you've just started yesterday. But um, uh, it is a practical question. Uh, yeah, it, it also depends, I guess, on the person. Like, I, I would, I'm, I'm away from home too much to be able to be with someone who's very demanding mm. of my time. I need to be with someone who is very independent and can do their own thing and I do my thing and... When we're together, it's wonderful as well, you know, mm. but, you know, I always, or well, I think Mika said at the beginning of a relationship, you know, we mustn't complete each other. It mustn't be that without the other one, something's missing. We must just fulfill each other. It mustn't be that, um, you know, we, we are dependent on each other. And uh, that's one of the things I really love about her, you know, even, even if we go to, a party together or if she comes with me to a show you know if I'm chatting to audience members afterwards I don't want someone who's standing there and like oh mm. now I'm being left alone you know she can also go and chat to people you know and yeah but I think um, it works well for us and I think distance makes the art grow fonder and I think Mika also just enjoys it when I'm gone you know um, <laughs> she enjoys having the house to herself I think for her it's a bit peace and quiet. She doesn't have me bouncing from the walls, cracking jokes around every corner. 
Um, so, you know, I think a week together, week apart, week together, week apart, that works well for us. You know, I would drive, if, if I had a job where I was just home all the time, I would drive her crazy. It, no, no doubt, no doubt. And uh, talking about home, um, how do you choose where you want to be and what you want it to be like? Uh, do you look for space? Do you look for trees or light or um, privacy or whatever? Um, yeah, in terms of where in the country, I, where, where, where I can live, where I have to fly the least is where I want to live. Mm. Um, it's mm. part of the reasons I moved up from Cape Town to Joburg. At some stage, it was nice because Mika had a flat in Linden, I had a flat in Cape Town. We were this multi-city couple and she could come to Cape Town and stay with me and I could come to Joburg and stay with her and we it's almost like we had two homes it was awesome mm. but you know practically we never were at my flat we were just never there because we were both just working in Johannesburg all the time and we always had like this romantic idea of like oh we can just pop down to Cape Town any weekend go have a weekend in Cape Town and you know with our schedules that ended up happening once in a year um so, you know, and Joburg is just that place for me. I have to be in Cape Town less than I have to be in Joburg. So it's mm. better for me to fly down to Cape Town every now and then, because if I have to fly to Joburg the whole time, that's like multiple times a week, up and down, up and down, and it just gets mm. too much. Um, you know, there was a time that last year that I was living in Cape Town that I was flying so much, I would sleep on the plane and then wake up and ask the air stay, sorry, where are we now? Uh, and then they'd be like, we in Joburg. And then I'm like, okay, cool. Then I just had to kind of wrap my mind around, you know, what city I'm actually in, you know? And it's, it's very cool to travel a lot, but it, it, can, it can just get too much. And the older I'm getting, you know, I, only, I turned 29 yesterday, so I'm not old, but um, the older I get, the, the more I enjoy living at home or being at home I'm, I think yeah, I'm an old yeah. spirit but um when I'm just like at home glass of red wine and I make a little fire that year in our kachel oh it's the best when I was 21 I would have hated that but like <laughs> now I love it and um in terms of where I live like I think safety is our biggest thing um especially also because I'm away a lot and Mika's mm. home alone just with a dog she is a very kind of scared person when it comes to crime and stuff. So we found ourselves a beautiful complex. When you drive in, it feels like an Arctic Fear resort. All the units are painted the same color. There's grass, there's a swimming pool and a tennis court. It feels like I'm like at a Aventura resort when I drive in here. Um, and it's just super safe and it's just nice to when you hear a noise in the night because you know houses just have noises at night your first thought is not like okay mm. this is it mm. here we go they're in people are in here you know and and you know, yeah yeah mm. and unfortunately and also, it is a reality you know you also want a place for your dog huh yeah and we've got a little garden and mm. uh, we are basically on delta park uh, so it's literally a five minute down the road and we in the park with him and he can run around and be crazy there. And yeah, no, it's awesome. Okay. Thank you, Scott. So I'll leave you so that you can take, what's his name? Otis. Otis, you can take Otis, Otis is a doggy, he is a doggy daycare at the moment. I'm actually going to go to my parents now because I didn't see them yesterday on my birthday. So I'm going to have lunch with them. Well, say hi to them from us Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> and have a wonderful year. I, I hope it, it brings good things. Thank good you work for your work, play. Ruda. Yeah, you too. Okay, bye of worst good. Like bye. Thank you for watching, for listening and go well. We'll meet soon.